the uh, topic, of course, is Yirmiyahu. And uh, before we start with a particular uh, text today, I um, just wanted to uh, reflect on the fact that the some of the chapters of Yirmiyahu, 52 chapters, some of them have been chosen as the Haftorah, or the Haftorot, for different times of the year. Um, of course, the Haftorot after Tishabov, the Haftorot of Consolation, are not coming from Yirmiyahu. The, Haftorot, the seven Haftorot of Consolation are from Yeshayahu, all seven of them, from the second half of Yeshayahu, Shiva de Nechemta. But the Haftarot before Tishabov, which are three, there's a series of three Haftarot that are recited before Tishabov. Two of those three are from Yirmiyahu. They are, in fact, the first couple of chapters of Yirmiyahu. Three weeks before Tishabov, we start with three Shabbatot before we start with the beginning of Yirmiyahu, Tivrei Yirmiyahu. And then the next week, we continue with the second chapter of Yirmiyahu. So the Haftarot of Yirmiyahu are actually preceding Tishabov, and actually the on Tishabov itself, the Haftorah of Tishabov itself, in the morning of Tishabov there's a Haftorah, which we'll take a look at uh, this morning, that's also from Yirmiyahu, that's chapters chapters 8 and 9 of Yirmiyahu. So actually, the holiday of, or the holiday, the, the day of Tishabov is, which is the day of, of mourning and a fast day. What precedes it is your miho and what we read on, uh, on, uh, on uh, Tishabov is also from your miho. It's interesting. I was thinking that the haftorah that immediately precedes Tishabov is not from your miho. The haftorah that precedes Tishabov immediately, which we call Shabbat Chazon, that haftorah is from Yeshayo. That's actually chapter one of Yeshayo. Week, week one and two are the first two chapters of Yirmiyo. Week three, which is right before Tishabov, is the first chapter of Yeshayo. So I had, was thinking about that last night, what, what that's about, and I, I believe the following, that the, uh, the Haftarot that we recite, generally speaking, there's a connection between the Haftarot and the, uh, and the, and the Parsha. Generally, that's true, and we actually typically try to we try to find the link between the haftorah and the parsha. That is not always true, and I think that the haftorot of Yirmiyahu that we read three weeks before Tishabov, two weeks before Tishabov, have nothing to do with the parsha. In fact, it's not always the same parsha. Sometimes there's a double parsha, the, usually a double parsha at the end of Bar Sometimes it's one parsha. So it's really not about the parsha. Those haftarot are the time of the year before we mark uh, the National Day of Jewish Mourning. So we read the parsha for Yirmiyahu. I was thinking that the haftorah that we read before Tishabov, Yeshayahu, is not so. The haftorah of Yeshayahu, Chazon, parsha's Chazon, is always read the same parsha. It's always parsha Dvarim. We always start the book of Dvarim before Tishabov. And that's hard. It's not an accident. It's it's always the same way, and I think the and the haft, and the book of Devarim uh, begins with the very first thing we're told. And this is what Moshe teaches us. And the first thing Moshe says in the book of Devarim is the fact that he appointed judges. He appointed judges for all of Israel, and the second thing he talks about is the episode of the uh, of the uh, Meraglim. Those, that's how the book of Devarim starts with. Appointing judges, and then the episode of the, of the spy episode. And actually, the two, the, those two are actually connected in the Chumash, because the idea of judging is making, making the right decision. If you don't know what to do, says Moshe, come to me, I'll tell you what to do. And then the story of the spies, as described in the book of Devarim, is exactly that. The, the, the scouts come back, spies return, and the people, based on the, what the spies are saying, Make a decision not to go into the land, and Moshe intervenes. Says, "Don't, don't do that. Do what I tell you to do." And they refuse to listen. So that's how the book of Devarim begins. So the incident of the spies actually is an event that the tradition, our rabbinic tradition, assigns to what Tishabov. Right? The the two great sins of the desert. The first is the golden calf. 
that the tradition ascribes to Shivas of Batamus. And the second incident, the spy episode, that takes place on Tishuba, according to rabbinic tradition. So it's very appropriate that we read the book of Devarim always before Tishuba, without exception, always. And the Haftorah of Chazon, Shapashar Chazon, is all about justice. Tzion b'mishpati podeh. That's how the Haftorah ends. Tzion is redeemed through, through Mishpat. And that's how the book of Dvarim begins. Shoftim is the beginning of Sefer Dvarim. So I was thinking that actually, the reason that we actually read the Haftorah from Yeshayah before Tisha B'av is because the Haftorah of Yeshayah was not just re- related to, to Tisha B'av, but it's also related to the uh, Parsha. But the other two Haftorah that we recite that are both from the Yerbi Yahu, and nothing to do with the Parsha. It's simply about Tishbab. They're about the impending destruction, the doom, the foretelling of the tragedy, and all that. And that the Haftorah on Tishbab is also Yirmiyahu. So the, our tradition assigns this time of the year and the mourning of, of the Jewish people, the, the one who actually is uh, the person who represents the calamity of destruction, the mourning, and the crying for the mourning as well. The lamenting, that's uh, that's Yermio, that's our that's our subject. So I was thinking about it. It's also very interesting, by the way. I wondered about this for many years. That on Tisha B'av, we are reading uh, the week before Tisha B'av, we start the Book of Devarim. A book, by the way, which the Book of Yermio and the Book of Devarim have 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 intimate connections, as we'll see, language-wise and, and theme-wise. They're intimately connected. The um, the Torah reading on Tisha B'av, Tisha B'av morning. So what do we read on Tisha B'av morning? We read on Tisha B'av morning, uh, it starts with Kitorid Banim, Ubnei Banim, and Oshantem Ba'aretz, which is taken from Parshat Vayet Chanan, the Parsha after Dvarim. So you gotta wonder, you gotta wonder about to the degree to which the tradition reflects the fact that Yirmiyo and Sefer Dvarim are tied together, and that the core readings actually around Tisha B'av from the Torah, say for Dvarim, and from the pr- prophetic writings is, is Yirmiyahu. So the, clearly the tradition understands that these two, two books are very much connected to each other. So that's my way of introduction. So if you've had a chance to look through Yirmiyahu to some extent, you see that there is an awful lot of uh, prophesying about impending destruction exile, doom, terrible stuff. And this uh, takes place uh, in many of the chapters of the book. And I would add that it's quite repetitive as well. I'm not gonna go through all of these. Uh, the repetition I think is intentional, it's not accidental. He's repeating the same message over and over again for any number of reasons that we'll get to. So I thought we would pick out, at least at this point, one of the uh, prophecies about the destruction and I thought a good one to pick out would be one of the, what we read on, on Tisha B'Av itself, which is uh, basically chapter 8 and chapter 9, not all of it, but most of chapter 8 and 9 of Yermio, and to take a look to choose. I want, don't want to spend all our time on prophecies of destruction, doom, and it's uh, very depressing. Uh, but, and, and the book has much more than that to it, by the way. But we should, we've till now not really talked about that very much, so we should pick out one section. So at the section I thought it would be appropriate would be chapter 8, beginning in verse 13, which is the half Torah for Tisha of morning. And it begins with a very strange uh, phrase, hard to know what it means. Asof asifem the Umar Hashem. Asof asifem. Asof asifem, which is chapter 8, verse 13. So it's strange because the word asaf, aleph, Samach Pei means to gather, to gather. Where soap is to gather. But Asifem is actually a different word. Right. It's the word sof, actually. Right. Tisofe, right? Nispeh. Half, we had that in the parsha. Half tisped tzadikim im 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 rasha, was Abraham's prayer to God. Would you tisped from the word sof? Would you, would you bring an end to the, the righteous together with the with the villainous, that's Abraham's argument with God in Sodom. So tisbeh is from the word sof. But asof is not from the word sof. Asof is from the word asaf. So what do you mean? Obviously, it's a play on asof asifem. Now, it is true 
that sometimes the word asaf, to gather in, can mean the end. For example, we had in the we had this in the parasha too. So there's, he's gathered into his people. And it says it's not an end. He's, 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 he's part of a, a, a bigger tradition. So we have, in any event, which plays on Asaf and Sof. So let's, typically it's translated as, I will make an end to them. Now, Having said that, this, this uh, verse begins with God's statement, I'll make an end to these people. We have to bear in mind, and this is true in general of the prophetic writings, especially Yirmiyahu, that that is not the only voice in the book. In fact, a very powerful uh, a statement that's found more than once in the earlier chapters that we didn't go through is I'm going to punish them, I'm going to subject them to terrible things. But I'm not going to finish them off. And that's a phrase that appears several times in the book. So we have to take Asof Asifem Nu Mashem with many tons of salt. It doesn't mean God is going to finish us off, but it means it's going to be very bad. But it's not, God won't finish us off. There's always, within these uh, prophecies, there's always the other side of it, which is there's always some, a chance of return, as we saw. There's always some hope for the future. Some will survive. And there's even, even promises of restoration that we'll get to later, which is very striking. We'll, we'll get to this later on. The promise of restoration, which I think is unique to Jeremiah, as we'll see. There's something unique to Yirmiyahu about this prophecy of restoration. And we'll get there. Anyway, so far, see, fame, no, Hashem, I will, I will make an end to them. Ain elovim ba gefen, be ain tenim ba tena, ve'alen novel, v'aten lahem yavrum. I'm using the JPS translation. Uh, some of the phrases here are hard to translate. No grapes left on the vine, no figs on the fig tree. The leaves have withered. What I have given them is gone. But tenuhem, what I gave them, but tenuhem, you have ruined his past, is gone. Yes, now that is a good point, actually. That is a very good point. You're 100% right. Uh, not necessarily, you you're correct that this verse does remind us of the prophecy of your, yes, correct. But actually elsewhere in your Miyahu is an exact parallel to Yeshayahu's prophecy. And what Adele was pointing out is that in the beginning of Yeshayahu, there's a prophecy, there's a parable of, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the, of the, of the vineyard. There's a very famous parable in the beginning of Isaiah, towards the very beginning of the, Gimel Peri Gimel, right in the beginning of, of the vineyard. And that parable of the vineyard has a parallel in the book, a very precise parallel in the book of Yirmiyo. So she suggests this verse already reminds us of that, which may be true. And I'm simply saying that in addition to this verse, there's a more precise parallel within Yirmiyo. Maybe we'll get to it. But it's, yes, the vineyard is, is, is used as, the, as a, a parable in Yishayo. That's very, actually a very important point. Thank you for that. Okay, now let's continue. Amar Nachli Yoshevim. Hey, Asmu v'navo, so the second verse of the Haftorah, why are we sitting here? <coughs> let us gather together. Hey, Osfu. Again, the word hey, Osfu. Let's gather together. And let's go. A Mivsar is a fortified town. Let's go to the fortified cities. What, for what purpose? Not, not what you might think. And will survive, but rather v'nid besham, it's better to die there. Let's go to the fortified and meet, and meet our doom v'nid besham, because our God has caused us to drink a bitter, a bitter drink, a bitter drink, may rosh, a bitter drink, for we have sinned unto God. So the verse is interesting for two reasons. First of all, the idea of going to the fortified city. But we'd rather die in the fortified city than die alone in some other isolated place. That recalls for us a set of verses that Yirmiyot goes back to very often, which is the what we call the Tochach of Sefer Dvarim. But in the admonition of Sefer Dvarim, which is chapter 28 of Sefer Dvarim, there's the opposite. In the admonition of Sefer Dvarim, very long chapter, terrible stuff. So that's chapter 28 of Dvarim. And there, it says the following. 
There it says, um, let's find that verse. Yeah. Chapter 28 of Devarim, verse, talks about the enemy coming from a faraway place. It's another theme of, that's a basic theme of Yirmiyo, coming from far away. And then it says, in verse 52 of chapter 28, so it talks about the enemy, it will shut you up. It will cause you, it's in the word narrow, it will close you in. Close in on you, in all your towns, throughout your land, until every mighty towering wall in which you trust has come down. So in the 52, verse tw chapter 28 of the volume, verse 52. And there it talks about the fortified towns that you trusted in. The, the, the Tokacha says you, you believed that you have security, but you have no security because the, even the places that you think are, mif are, are fortified, that are mi the, the, mif the Mifsarim, that those places will not bring you any, any, any security. You have the false hope, false expectations. And that's the theme of the Tochacha, the theme of the Tocha. In Yermiyahu, he takes it in a different direction. He has people saying, not let's go to the fortified cities because that's where we're safe, but rather let's go, we might as well die, die in our own cities, in our Reha Mitzah, right? In the fortified cities. And by the way, in particular, I take note of the fact that in the very beginning of the book, when God tells Yermio what his job is, uh, Yermio is not so happy necessarily, but that's your task. This is what you are. And don't worry, says God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect you. You're going to be totally safe. At the end of chapter 1, verse number 18, Va'ani hayom le'ir mitzar la'amud barzel u'chamot nechoshat ha'kol ha'aretz so I'm going to make you, God says to you, I'll make you a fortified place, a fortified city, an iron pillar, bronze walls. They will attack you. They will not overcome you. So Yermio himself is described as an Yermio Tsar, as a fortified city. That's a city that you can't actually capture. And over here in our uh, chapter, Haftorah, so here's the opposite. Here, the people say, why should we stay here isolated? Let's go, let's go to the cities. V'nid mesham. So it's kind of a hopelessness and a recognition that no place is safe. Even the fortified places are not safe. That's the first half of this verse. And the second half of the verse, another phrase that appears many times in Yirmiyo, many times, is the idea, Hashem elokeinu hadimanu, God has doomed us, he has caused us to drink. Rosh is something which is bitter. Drinking the bit, God has caused us to drink the bitter waters. And that's a, what? Exactly. Two things. So first of all, as Suri says, that appears in chapter 30 of Dvarim. That's chapter 30. It says, lest one person amongst you think there's, there's the covenant. And the covenant is for everybody. And the Torah says, maybe somebody is thinking in their own heart, I will follow my own willful heart. I didn't count up the number of times in Yirmiyol that expression is found. I suspect it's at least 20 times, but I have to check that out. But many times. You, you read the book through, you can't miss it. And there, the person who decides secretly to follow his or her own willful heart the, the Torah says, the person says uh, that that person is called a shoresh pore rosh vilana, a kind of bitter, a, a, a person of, of bitterness. So the idea of, and then God will take uh, God's anger out against that particular person who secretly decides to do things counter to the covenant. Now the idea of being a, a bitter person, here it's being fed, being given, right? Being given Bitter, bitter waters is, of course, echoed in chapter 30 of Devarim, but it's, of course, a whole parish in the Chumash, which we call the Sota. That's so exactly what the Sota story is. Chapter 30 of Deuteronomy is based on the Sota chapter. So the point is that 
the uh, expression over here, which appears many times in Yirmiyahu, that God has caused us to drink the bitter waters, Ki Chatanu Hashem, the first half of the verse, we have echoes of chapter 28 of Dvarim. The second half of the verse, we have echoes of chapter 30 of Dvarim, which reinforces the, excuse me? 29, I'm sorry, even better, even better. 29, 30 is repentance, right? 29 is correct, so it's 28 and 29, back to back, actually. So it's even, even better. So it's just another example that, and it makes total sense that the book of Yirmiyahu, of course, is constantly recalling verses from Sefer Devarim, comes back to my introduction this morning. That's probably why we are always reading, the, the Tisha B'Av reading always starts. Tisha B'Av always, the Shabbos before Tisha B'Av is always, without exception, the beginning of Sefer Devarim. Because that's Sefer Devarim, the, all the warnings are found in Sefer Devarim. And the Torah reading from Tisha B'Av is the second parasha in Sefer Devarim. Haftorah, of course, is your meal. Okay, that's the way we begin now. And now the, let's just read through this depressing chapter. Kaveh with shalom v'yein tov, v'yeit marpei v'yinei ba'ata, hope for, hope for peace, but there is no good, hope for some kind of healing, and there's terror. Midan nishma nacharat susav, mikol mitzalot abirav rasha kol ha'aretz, v'yavo v'yochu eretz umro'a ir v'yoshveba. So the prophecy, People are hoping for good, hoping for relief. This is also very much at the center of the long admonition in Sefer Dvarim, which is not just about objective suffering, but it's a psychological. A lot of the suffering is psychological. And here as well, it's about the terror. It's about basically despair. We had hoped for good, but we're not seeing any good. We had hoped for some peace. There is no peace. And remember that this hasn't taken place yet. In other words, the prophecy over here is we done nishma nacharatu sav from the north, and we hear the, the pounding of the hooves, right? This, he's prophesying what's going to be in the future. He hasn't. This, we haven't seen this yet. So Yirmiyo is is prophesying, imagining what people might be thinking, uh, what might, people might be thinking when they come to a recognition that the uh, that the, uh, the very uh, pessimistic uh, outlook is actually take, going to happen. And the next verse is similar. God says, I will send against you serpents that cannot be charmed. The idea of charming the serpent is, is rendering the, the serpent uh, innocuous. But the serpents that I will send, in the Hashim, there's no charmer for them. There's, there's no Unlike, unlike the story in the Chumash of the of the of the uh, of the Nechash Nechoshet, with the Chash Nechoshet, we don't charm them over there, but there's a way to. Moshe builds the banner, right? It makes the bronze the bronze serpent, and when they look at the bronze serpent, they are they are they are healed. <laughs> Moshe actually, the people had actually requested from Moshe that, please pray unto God that the snake should not bite us. God doesn't answer that prayer. The snakes do bite them, but there's a way to cure you. But in any event, there's a cure. That point is well taken. Here's Nechashim, Asha'in, Lehem, Rachash. There is no hope. Fine. Yes? Yeah, that could be so. Could be, could be right about it. It's interesting. Could be that it plays off that as well. So we, let me just make a point about what Suri is saying, a general point about it, about the repetitions in the book of Yirmiyahu. There are, first of all, many repetitions. He says the same thing many times. And not just that, it's a book, we saw this last week, it's a book which actually recalls other pieces of the Bible. It sometimes even recalls them word for word. Remember, we read last week about the prophecy of Micha. Micha Morashti had the following prophecy, Sion, right? And it actually, it's very unusual, when you look up the book of Micha, you find the, the prophecy word for word. It's actually according it word for word. And we have that many places in Yirmiyahu that he is alluding to, 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 to other prophecies. And I think the reason for that possibly, or hypothesize, that one of the reasons for the constant repetition, and not just repetition, 
but recalling earlier prophecies, is that one of the themes of Yirmiyahu is found in Malachim too, but it's especially in Yirmiyahu, the idea that God, God says, I have sent you prophets throughout all the ages. I've been sending you prophets for many, many years, many times, and you refuse to listen so that Yirmiyahu sees himself, it's not just you did bad and you're being punished, but Yirmiyahu sees himself as kind of the last straw, as the, as the culmination of a whole process, a whole set of, of misdeeds, and I'm not the first prophet to come. I'm just, unfortunately, the one who has to come at the end and give the bad news. But there were many, many other prophets who came before me. So it's not so surprising that in the book of Yirmiyahu, I mean, we find the allusions to other texts all the time, but it's very pronounced in the book of Yirmiyahu, and I think in the case of Yirmiyahu, we can hypothesize that this may be the reason for it, because he emphasizes so many times, I sent you other prophets, the expression is, Hashkem v'shaloch, they got up, and I, and, and I sent them. In other words, it was, it was a constant uh, attempt to move people in the, in the, in the, in the right direction. Right. So let's just, this is how the Haftorah begins. I wanted to take a look uh, at the end of chapter eight, at the end of chapter eight, two verses, and one other point about this chapter and in general about Yirmiyahu, that very often, very often, I'll speak for myself, maybe I just don't understand it, but very often I can't actually tell who's speaking. I can't tell if, if the people are speaking or if Yirmiyahu himself is speaking, and sometimes I can't even tell if God is speaking. Those are the three possibilities. I guess the narrator would be the fourth possibility. But it's often hard to tell whether Yirmiyahu speaks personally whether he speaks on behalf of God or speaks on behalf of the people. For example, in verse 21 of chapter 8, Al Shevra Batami Hoshbarti, which means Shevra is shattered. My people, because my people are shattered, Hoshbarti, I am shattered. Kodarti, Kodarti is darkness, Kodarti. I, I'm dejected. I'm, I'm, I'm mis miserable. Shama hechazikadi. I'm seized by desolation. That sounds like it's Yirmiyahu talking, actually. Al shever batami hoshparti. Even though his mess, his, his role is to deliver message of doom, but he's also one of the people. And then he continues. Hatsari en begilad im rofe en sham kimadu alo alta aruchat batami. Now, again, it's hard to know. Is Yirmiyo talking personally? Or is it somebody in the nation talking and, say, and speaking for the people? About his only experience for speaking for the people, it's hard to know. Let's, let's say it's Yirmiyo talking. Is there no, it's another expression that appears more than once in the book, is there no bomb in Gilead? Very famous expression. Well, what does it mean there's no bomb in Gilead? In other words, why, how do we get to this situation? Someone's very sick. When you go to the doctor, another, and there are doctors. There is bomb in Gilead. There, 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 there are those who could help us, who could cure us. Why are my people so sick? Why, are they, why haven't they been healed? Well, the answer is they didn't, either they didn't consult the doctor, or the doctor wasn't, they didn't listen to the doctor's advice. You've heard that before. Or maybe the doctor wasn't a really good doctor. That's another possibility, but, and they're both true in Yemio. But you're questioning, how, how did we get to this mess how, in the first place? Why didn't we consult those who could have helped us? So it sounds like Yirmiyo is talking. Mi'itain Roshi Mayim. Very famous verses. V'yaini makar dima v'yeka yomam v'alayla et chalalei batami. If my head were water, my eyes a source of tears, I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. So it sounds, it sounds like Yirmiyo is talking, actually. And he actually identifies with the people, despite the fact that he criticizes them all the time. And actually, the next verse is very interesting as well, which is, here's chapter 9, verse 1. This is the Haftorah of Tisha B'Av. Oh, he says, I would want to be in the, I wish I could be in the desert. An encampment for wayfarers. Right, people that don't have a place. I would abandon my people. I would leave them. They're all adulterers and a band of, of rogues. It sounds like 
Now, the, we don't know that the chapters are not our division, basically. And that's a Christian division about the 12th century or something, which the Jews don't actually accept to about 200 years ago altogether. But in any event, when you look at the, the way it's written in the, in the text, there's no break between this, these verses. The break comes later after verse number two. And it sounds like it's the same person talking, actually. It sounds like the first verse, Mi'itain Roshi Mayim. And the second verse, Mi Yitneni Ba Midbar, are spoken by the same person, even though they actually are completely different verses. The first verse says, I would cry day and night for my people. If I had the ability, I would never stop crying. The second verse says, I wish I could leave them and abandon them altogether. The world no good. It's the same person talking, both verses. And that is very important in terms of Yir Miyal. On one hand, he, he bemoans the state of the people. And he's critical of them. He blames them. Blames a lot of people, but he blames them also. At the same time, he says, these are, these are my people. I, I, I have to, I'm crying for them day and night. I cry about the situation. I cry for the people, etc. Now, what's next is interesting is he now singles out a particular thing they do wrong. Singles this out. And the, what's interesting is this is, I find extremely interesting. It's not unique to your meal, but it's very much here. What did, what did they do wrong? Now, there were adulterers, a band of rogues, whatever. He's, he's a citation from God. They bend their tongues like bows. They are valorous for treachery, not for honesty. They're dishonest. They advance from evil to evil. They don't listen to me, declares God. And now the example is given. One person, Ish, a person should be careful. It's a actually. A Mireya is a friend, but not necessarily a friend that you totally trust. So be careful, you know? What is it say in the Godfather? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer, right? You got to be careful because you can't really trust anybody. Don't trust your brother. Why can't you trust your own brother? It's very striking. For your brother... Akov Yaakov. Akov Yaakov. We'll get to that in a minute. Bechol Reya Rachil Yaro. So here we have Reya. You can't trust the Ach and you can't trust the Reya. Don't trust your friend or one you think is your friend. And don't trust your own brother. Ki kol Ach Akov Yaakov. Now the expression Akov Yaakov obviously talks about the story, references Yaakov who is a brother, but he's a brother, one might say in this plain reading of, sorry, from the brother's standpoint, he's a brother who has betrayed his brother. In fact, Esau says it very clearly. When Esau comes into his father to get the blessing that Yitzchak intended to give Esau, and uh, Yitzchak says, who are you? Well, what do you mean, who am I? I'm, I'm Esau, your son. See, and Yitzchak says, Right? Who, who's the one who came before you? Right? And I blessed him. And he's blessed. Esau says, what is this business? Did he call himself Jacob? He has, he's been crooked to me twice. He has circumvented me twice. He, st- he took my birthright. And he stole my blessing. The bracha and the b'chorah. He took the birthright. Okay, Yesav sold him the birthright. That's true. But he sold him the birthright because he thought he was going to die of hunger. He came back tired. So Yaakov took advantage of that situation. And then the blessing. Of course, he simply pretends to be Yesav. And that is in the Chumash. So Yesav says, And whatever you think of that story, which is a story of an incredibly interesting story, but you see that the, in the prophetic writings, they understand that the uh, Yaakov in that story is actually something problematic. Ki ko'ach o'kov Yaakov. 
can't miss it. Yes, what do you want to say, Sarah? It could be possible. Right. It is true what you said the other day, that Mireim, there's Reim and Mireim, that is true. Ish Mireim could be, be careful from your friend. Right, it could be so. That's the Mary. Later it says Reya. When you get to Ach, or maybe it's a play on Mireim. But later on, the whole Reya, Rachil Yaloch, that means actually a friend. In other words, trust nobody. You can't actually trust anybody, even your own brother. And actually, what's interesting is that the, uh, the uh, prophet here actually further references the story of Yaakov and Esau in the very next pasuk. Um, they have, don't speak truth. They've trained this, they, themselves to speak falsely. It is certainly truer than the story of Yaakov. He doesn't tell the truth. Who are you? Now, what's equally true, by the way, as an aside, that in this, this is not a defense of Yaakov, but it is interesting that he is clearly does a very poor job of, uh, you know, he's, he's not a good liar, actually. Um, he comes in, how come you, who, who are you? How are you back so soon? Oh, I'm, I'm, I am, he says, I, Anochi, I am Asa. He says, I am Asa. He says, I did everything you told me to do. I did everything you told me to do, right? Is always said from someone who doesn't actually know exactly what he's supposed to do, right? I remember when I was in high school. So the trick is when you go take a test and you don't have a clue what you're, what you're doing. It happened to me all the time. How do you write it in such a way that's so vague that it could be construed as actually, you know? So this is, Yaakov is very actually uncomfortable. He's not a very good liar. He's a pretty clever fellow, but he doesn't lie very well. And uh, so that's true. On the other hand, what he says, I am ace of your, your son, is obviously their oldest son, is untrue. So obviously he speaks the untruth. And the next verse is like, Shiftecha betochem mirma, bimirma, meyanu dat otinu mashem. You dwell amidst mirma. Mirma is deceit or deception, right? It's a negative word. Mirma is always a negative word. And you dwell amongst deception, says God. And through deception, you refuse to, to, to know me. You can't know God if you are deceptive. Now, of course, in the story of Yaakov and Esau, after, 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 after Esau complains that he can't, was he Yaakov, twice he has deceived me, twice he has supplanted me, and Yitzhak's answer is, Your brother came to Mirma. Now, as much as the apologists try to explain Mirma in some positive sense, there is no way that the word Mirma can ever be positive. Mirma is always negative. And what? In the Shrem story, it's 100% negative, right? That B'nai Yaakov spoke for Mirma. And they're right, they spoke for Mirma. Vayanu B'nai Yaakov B'mirma. So that is a, the Shrem story where the Torah critiques everybody. Nobody gets off free there. So Mirma is a negative term. And Mirma is also played with in the case of Lavan. Not the word Mirma, but, but, right? Lama Rimitani. Plays with Mirma. Lama Rimitani. Lama is a Ramai. Lama Rimitani. Here it's interesting that Jacob is, Jacob is Israel. Jacob is us. Now Jacob, the name Israel doesn't appear over here. Only the name Jacob appears. The name Israel always has a much more positive cast to it. Israel is also Yashar, which is the opposite of Yaakov. Yashar is straight and Yaakov is crooked. But over here it's also interesting through Mirma in deception, may anu dat otinu Hashem you refuse to, to know me, right? The goal, as we'll see, the goal of this Haftorah, the goal of this section is to know God. However, whatever that means, we'll see what it means to know God. This is the last verse of the Haftorah of Tishaba. That's the goal. But what's interesting is that the verb, lima'ain, to refuse, is a verb that appears in the book of Breshit three times. Three times you have lima'ain. The first time, the first, second time is Yosef. The first time is Jacob. When Jacob is told by, when Jacob is shown the coat of Joseph, the brothers send him the coat. They show him the coat. 
Father, do you recognize the coat? Do you recognize the coat? Hakena, Hakatonit Bincha, is it the coat of your son? And Jacob says, Jacob recognizes it. He recognizes it right away. It's a special coat he gave to Yosef. Right? Ketonet Fani, right? It's, it's the coat of my son. Maybe a wild animal ate him up. And all the sons and daughters, it says, arose to console him. But Jacob refuses to be consoled. He refuses to be consoled. He won't accept the fact that Joseph is dead. He suspects he's dead. But he refuses to be consoled. He's not going to sit shiver. Because the moment he sits shiver, he's saying Joseph is dead. He's not willing to accept that. Because bring me the body. He always sees a coat. So the father won't forget his son. That's the end of chapter 37. Right? 38 in the Torah is Yehud and Tamar. So let's call it a digression. 39 begins with Yosef Urad Mitzrayma. And then we have the beginning of chapter 39. Next, wait, the next story about Joseph, Mrs. Potiphar. Mrs. Potiphar, who propositions Joseph. And the Torah says, Vayimaein. He refuses. Vayimaein. The Shoshelas. And that's why the Medrash says he saw his father's image. Because the Medrash picks up on the two Vayimaeins. They actually pretty much follow each other. If you take out Judah and Tamar, which is a separate story, the continuation of the Joseph story, that's the second time. Now, where's the third time? First two, we all know. It appears three times in Breshit. Where is time number three? Which is very interesting. The first time is Jacob. The second time is Joseph. Where is the third time? What? Hint is, I, I already gave you the hint. Right, right, right. right. By the way, I tell you that many years ago, I used to teach in a law firm. Guy came from Israel. It happened to be, I forget what the, we're studying, uh, the we're studying Gracious then actually. And it, this Parsha, and I talked about this, and the guy was so taken with this, I, with the sheer actually, so taken with it, person who teaches, uh, he sort of became my Talmud Chaver for life actually. He followed me around every place because of that sheer. The third time it appears is with Jacob and Joseph in the following story. Stories at the end of Jacob's life. He goes down to Egypt and he, he wants to give a blessing to Joseph. He wants to build the family because the, the missing piece in the family is, is Yosef. Yosef's a Mitzrayim and Yosef is married to the Egyptian woman. And he travels around with his uh, chariot, you know, with his uh, Pharaoh's chariot. And he's soft as Paneah. And he's married, his father was the priest of Egypt. So, in short, right? Right. So, ja Yaakov says to Yosef, Yosef brings his, Yosef, Yaakov's dying. So, Yosef brings his sons to Yaakov. Yaakov says, who are these children? Who are they? Miela, who are they? Well, these are my sons. Oh, really? I want to bless them. So, he sounds like he doesn't even know what he's doing, right? He's so old. He can't see. He's blind, it says. He can't see. He says, who are they? And then, of course, he blesses them the way, as we know, he, put, he blesses them together. The, the, the two boys he blesses together, Menashe and Ephraim, but he switches his hands. Puts his right hand on the head of, of Ephraim and the left hand on Menashe, and Yosef, gets a, Yosef tries to pull his hand away. By he, pulled, he, goes, he pulls his, the old man's hand. He's trying to pull his hand off the head. No, you're making a mistake, Father. You know, no, this is the, this is the one. You're confused, right? No, this. So Yaakov says, Vayimain Aviv. That's Vayimain. He refuses. Yodati Bini. It's one of the great moments in the Chumash, actually. Yodati Bini Yodati. I may be old and I may be blind, but believe me, I know a lot better than you. Of course, the Chumash that he does. Yodati Bini Yodati. I know much better. You're right. They're both great. And they get a joint blessing, but this one's greater yet. So Vayimain over there is very interesting. I would say that the the goal of Yaakov in Mitzrayim is actually, it says he blesses Joseph. It's interesting, isn't it? He blesses Joseph. Yosef. The goal of Yaakov, the real goal, is to include Joseph in the family. Because let's face it, nobody can actually stand the guy. That, that's clear. The brothers can't take it, and the brothers don't trust him either. They think he's going to kill him. The last end of the Chumash. So how do you include him in the family? And Yaakov's thinking is, you include him through his children. They may not like Yosef. They have nothing against his sons. The nephews they like. So you include Joseph, and actually a double portion of Joseph, through the children. And that's, that's Yaakov's goal. As if Yaakov is saying, listen, my son, when you were missing for so many years, I never gave up on you. I always thought we can keep you in the family. 
You don't believe that now I'm going to give up on that dream, do you? By going your path, which is to give menashe, which means forgetfulness, primacy, that's not possible. Menashe can't be primary because menashe represents forgetfulness. Joseph said it. Ephraim is different. Ephraim is God is causing me to be fruitful in the land of my suffering, which is Mitzrayim. Ephraim represents an understanding that Mitzrayim is not our place. So I have to do it my way. Afterwards, you can, you have to get back to you, but it's got to be my blessing. So that's the Vayima'en. So Vayima'en is actually a Jacob word. And what's interesting is that in the book of Yirmiyahu, Yirmiyahu follows through with this. He takes it to the next step. Because in the book of Yirmiyahu, which has very little consolation in it, but there are two or three chapters of consolation. They both have Torahs, by the way. We're always looking for consolation in the Haftorahs. And one of the Haftorot, very beautiful, is the one that we read on uh, Rosh Hashanah. And on Rosh Hashanah, it's one of the most beautiful sections of the Bible. Hashem right? It's the second day Rosh Hashanah, the Haftorah. How does it end? It ends with Kob Ramah Nishma. There's a, there's, a, there's a cry in Ramah, right? What's the cry in Ramah? Rachel Mavakar Baneha. Rachel cries for her children. And what's the continuation? She refuses, Rachel refuses to be consoled. Which, of course, is what the Chumash says about Yaakov when they come to console him. He refuses to be consoled. And he refuses to be consoled about whom in that story? Jacob. About, about Joseph. How is Joseph described in the Chumash and say for Bracious, typically? A Nenu. He's a Nenu. Right? You have it several times. He's, he's not dead. In one place they say he's dead, but only one place. Typically, Jacob says it. That's what the guy who came to write my quest, his name Shibon Yosef is his name actually. Yosef Yosef So Rachel is described by Yirmiyahu as being a Jacob person. Right? Rachel Mavaka Albanela, right, right? Right? Jacob was crying when he right, Jacob cries, right? By Yefko to Aviv. Oh, it means Jacob cries. No, no one has to cry for Joseph. But Yaakov cries for Yosef. He sees the potential in Yosef. He loves Joseph. And Vayimayin hit Nachem on the one that's a Nenu. So the point is that what Yirmiyo does in this book is he has the figure of Jacob, which is the one who is Yaakov, right? Which here is represented in a negative way. He, he, the, the one who speaks falsely in deceit can never write Me'en datoti. He, 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 re, he refuses to know me because if you're talking deceit, how could you know God? But later in the book, typically, he takes the very same phrase, right? And there it's not Jacob himself, but a Jacob character, which is Rachel. And there in Yermio, he presents Rachel as a kind of Yaakov figure. And she's the one who's crying, and she's the one who is refusing to be consoled. And she's the one who's refusing to be consoled about her children who are, who are, who are missing, who, who, are, who are a nenu. So you have in your Mio, he's very, he, he takes this theme, takes the language, and he transposes it to, 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 to Rachel. The Rachel of your Mio is very different than the Rachel of the Chumash. I mean, the, you can see already in the Chumash that Rachel is, in some respects, very similar to Yaakov. For example, so it's not coming out of nowhere. He what? With that's with Lava. In other words, no, they both they both steal right. They ignore Yaakov and Rav Ravan, but ignore Rachel and Atrafim. But that could mean something else. That in the case of Jacob, the story that actually is the transformative story of Yaakov in the Chumash is the story where Jacob is wrestling with this mysterious person, angel, and he becomes a different person. He's not just Jacob. As Jacob, he can't cross over. He only crosses over when he becomes Israel. And in that struggle, right, he's wrestling with this angel, I we understand it, and he becomes a different person. And this, the, the other person or angel says to him, your name is not Jacob, it's Israel, Israel, 
Ki sarita im Elohim v'yim anoshim v'atuchal. Because you have wrestled with God and with angels, right? With humans. V'atuchal. And you have prevailed. That's, that's the word. It's a transformation of Yaakov. That phrase, struggling and wrestling and prevailing, appears one other place in Sefer Bereshit, actually. Who said a similar, not identical, but a very similar thing. It's after, right? It's after Rachel gives Yaakov her slave, a servant, as a wife, Bila. And she has two children. First is Dun. And Rachel names the child Don. God has judged me. And the second is Naftali. Naftulei Elohim Niftalti. Imachoti Gam Yocholti. Right? Yeah. Whatever Naftulei. Naftulei is a difficult word. In modern Hebrew, what is Naftulei in modern Hebrew? I think it's an obsession, isn't it? It's negative, right. Well, obsession is negative. Right. Naftu, naftulim in modern Hebrew, I would think, has to do with an obsession. But 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 naftu, but the, the Mefarshim in the Chumash, who talk about Naftulei Ohim Niftauti, they relate it to the word Ketilim. Ketilim are like cords, right? Things that are wrapped around each other. And Naftulei Ohim Niftauti is very similar to Vayeyavek uh, Ichimo. Ichimo, in other words, being tied together with something. It's two people struggling, holding on to each other and struggling. And Rachel says about herself, I have struggled with my sister, but I have prevailed. In my struggle, I have prevailed. And the angel said about Jacob, I don't know, you have wrestled and you have prevailed. So the idea of struggling and wrestling, though it takes a different form, the idea of Rachel as being this one who is very spunky, I would say, and very determined and has a goal and doesn't give up. It keeps trying. She wants to have children. She keeps trying. Hoverly bonding. Take Billa. You have the mandrakes. You have the trophy. She dies in childbirth. And she's but struggling. At the end of the day, she's able to, she has the children. And then, of course, Menashe and Ephraim are more children for Rachel. But so, so in the Chumash already, you get a sense that there's something, Rachel and Jacob have something in common. He loves Rachel. But Yermio takes it to a different place, which is not the negative necessarily. It's wholly positive. She's the only person who doesn't give up hope. She's the only one. Same as Yaakov and Yosef. But Yefko to Aviv, the rest of the family, let's, let's move on with life. You know what I mean? Okay, Joseph, okay, sad story, whatever. Forget it. But Yaakov says, no, I, I never forget it. I, I, he's crying the whole time. He ref- absolutely refuses to give up. So that's the, here in chapter 9, in the Haftorah of Tishabov, here it's negative, right? Korach HaKov Yaakov. Here's the Mirma. And as long as they're Mirma, you can't actually know God. So what you got to do is rid yourself of the Mirma. So here, he doesn't suggest how, how you can do that, but here there's a reference to, he singles out, it's very striking, he singles out this particular story about the brother, about the Ach, and about the friend, yes, but, but yes. Um, there's another reference to Yaakov too in the Isti Re'ehu Yehatelo because Lava Yaakov says about Lava and God beats and hates him. That's also good. That's also very good. It's very good. It's, by the way, it's, here's what I want to say. One thing what Suri said, which is this: you take it as a compliment, but it, it is a compliment. But here's the point: when you're on the right track with something, you you, you see a million things. That's the truth of it. What? Okay, so, so, yeah. When you compare the story of love and take to Mitzrayim, which you will always do. Yes, of course. There's, this, this is one of them because the, the, the word swa is also used with Paro. It is, of course. So that's how it comes right. my head. It is true. It's used in, actually in Yisrael. A kwa tla shem asa madera. I'm not saying it's a hate song. Yes, yes. Right, yes, it's true. It is that true. It's also in Vayra, 100% true. It is true. Right. I your safe paro hotel. Right. right. Okay. Anyway, this is were, yes. While you were there, yeah. Sarita, you you struggle to be ascendant. Uh, Sarita and Elohim, it could be so. I mean, it's playing as well, obviously, from the word uh, right with the word. To, by the way, it reminded me since you um, where is that? 
Hold on one second. Is it in uh, <clears throat> Hosea, maybe? One second. <clears throat> Hosea. Let me just check one, one thing very quickly. Hosea. It's in Treos, but it's earlier, actually. Hosea is the first of Treos. So let's see if we can find this verse. Where is this verse? Hold on one second. One second, one second, one second. Hold on one second, one second, one second, one second. Where is this verse? The verse is about Yaakov. Yaakov. Hold on. I'm not going to. It's one of the half Torahs, actually. Where, where, where is it? Where is the verse? One second. Frustrating. I believe it's the Haftorah for Parshas Vayetze, I think. Where is that Haftorah for Parshas Vayetze? You have anybody have a chumash with the Parshas the Haftorahs there? It's your Bar Mitzvah Parsha. Bar Mitzvah. So let's see. Let's see here. Son, oh, you didn't, okay, well, whatever. Yeah? Where is it? I thought it's in Hosea, but I could be wrong about that. Where is this? Annoying. Take, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, what chapter? I'm looking, I'm looking at you now. You'd always die. But where's that pasuk? I can't find that pasuk. Yeah. You'd gimel. Who's the you'd gimel? Uh, maybe. Okay. But where is it? I can't. Searching high and low for this pasuk. Where's where's the pasuk? Right, so where's the pasuk? I don't see it. Chapter 13 of what? No, it is Hosea, right? It says chapter 12. Chapter 12. Pasuk Yud Gimel. Yeah, but that's not the pasuk I'm looking for. Oh. Oh. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. <laughs> right. right. No, it's okay. Maybe that's something it's, we're taking too much time in this. It's, it's just bothers me. Yeah, no, it's, the post I'm thinking of is Babetin or Kaves Achiv. Uva Ono Sara Elohim. Where is that post? Where? Where? Yeah, here it is. You're right. You're right all the time. Right. It is Hosea. It's chapter 12. Right. 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 Babetan or Kavet Achiv. Uva Ono Sara. That's why I mentioned it. Uva Ono Sara Elohim. Vayosar El Malach Vayuchal. Bacha Vayitchaninlo. Beit El Yimsa Enu. Visham Yedaber Imanu. That's it. So this is, right? In the womb, he tried to supplant his brother, Yaakov. Kavet Achiv. Uva Ono, in his strength, he strove with a divine being. So rather taking to strive. By Yasser, he strove with an angel and by Yuchau, he prevailed, right? The other had to Bacha by Yitchanan, or the other cried, doesn't say it in the Torah, but that the prophetic understanding, and he implored him. Jacob met him at Beit Eo and there communed with him. The point is, so you see already that the Nevi'im, Babet and Okavet, Ochiv, their Okav is less of a negative, I think, to wrestle with, to try to overcome. But in Yirmiyot, Chol Acha Chol Akov Yaakov is certainly negative, and he plays. See how the prophets are playing with that story, with the Akov, with this, with the Sarah, with the right. They you see this transformation. That's it's very very important. Okay, yeah, yes. No, that's not true. We'll see. We will see that actually. We'll see in Yermio. He talks about Shabbos specifically about Shabbos. So does Yeshayo. We'll get there. It's one of the later Shiurim. We'll get there. 
No, usually it's, usually it's generalities. Well, we, 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 we will see. But it's interesting, you're, you're right in general. But what, actually, the example you gave is very striking because in Yirmiyo, later on, there's a long section about Shabbos. You also have it in, in other prophetic, right? You have it in, in, in Yeshayo as well. By the way, I would say just in general, the connection between Yirmiyo and Yeshayo was a very good question. Yeshayo was earlier. And it's pretty clear that there's an influence of Yeshayo upon Yirmiyo. But we don't know exactly Yirmiyo's, who Yirmiyo's rebbe's were. We know that there seems to be some, we know that he's taking the Chumash, obviously, and playing off that. It would appear that certain sections, which we'll get to, are certainly they're found in Yishayel with a little different language. And then the, the, uh, the claim that, I haven't checked this out myself, and I'm very skeptical about these claims, but there certainly are commonalities between Hib's prophecies and some of Hosea. But the one who's actually singled out there are commonalities. I'm not saying it's a Rebbe, would be a little prophet called Sephania. Little three chapter prophet Sephania, who has many commonalities with Yermio. What do you want to say, though? Um, yes. Um, Rato, Rato doesn't want to be um, the nothing, but she doesn't accept any consolation. Right. He uses to himself. So that's a much deeper level of consolation. It's not, not only going to accept third party consolation from a, but it, the deep down inside him, he refuses to. Um, that's possible. But I, I will say the following you could be right, but, the, but there's another point, and that is that sometimes in biblical Hebrew, the, the, the reflexive form, the hit nachem, is not reflexive, but rather it's a kind of intensive. So you have to check that out. Sometimes they were hit, right? Right, we, exactly. We uh, we we, we hit paleo is understood to that's possible. It's possible that it means to judge yourself, but it's equally possible that it doesn't mean to judge yourself, but it means with faleo. By Yabot Pinchas, by your faleo, he prayed, and we hit paleo is an intensive form of paleo. So it doesn't necessarily when you pray, there is always, always an element of self judgment in prayer, that's for sure. If I'm asking for something, maybe I don't deserve it. That could be so. But the word of the hit parallel itself, I think it's an open question whether it means to judge oneself, or whether it means to speak in a very intensive and powerful way. But you could be right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, he does, right. And so, um, and then to Mirmet, which if you're thinking of this as poetry, you think of the sound. So what is the relationship even show is right? Because does a reya can become a good neighbor or a bad neighbor? It's the same show as of evil. But you know, Sammy, I'm not sure it's the same show. I'd have to check that out. But I would say the following. First of all, that it is poetry. And that poetry works, so does prose. But even poetry even more so works with associations. The first two words we saw this morning, asofa si fame, no mashem. Asofa si fame are two different words. One is asaf, and one is, it's alliterative. So the, you have in the uh, poetic writings, for sure, and as you say, before it was written down, it probably was spoken, right? So the point is, um, it's hard to know whether, I think sometimes the connections between words are not necessarily uh, uh, connections that you would find in a dictionary. But the more the way people speak, the more, you know, kind of, as you say, uh, alliterative. Maybe it's memory driven as well. It's a good question, but the, the point being that in poetry, you have much more kind of freedom you have in poetry, poetic license. I think that's very important, and because the, 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 the message is what's important over here, and the use of language is a, a way to get us to to accept the message or, or 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 to remember it. A song is the same way. Write down the shira we have in Devarim. Songs, when you you know when you have, you remember the words of the song very often, you wouldn't remember it without the song. When you remember the song, you also remember the words. Could be. It's possible. It's very hard to know. You know, the truth of the matter is that the line, we talk of prose and poetry. The line between them is not always clear. There's, it's, it's not that it's the prose or poetry. There's a kind of mythic prose, and that's different. And it's not poetry either, but it's not exactly prose either. So sometimes you can tell. Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's very hard to tell. Yes. 
can't find the precise pattern to see the true error or not. It's like you're hungry for the land. You work the land, you never got the trouble. Now this is like you're away from it. It's never mentioned again. That, that is actually an important point in the book. The claim that's made by some who write about the Book of Yirmiyahu, the claim that's made is, he, he, we know where he's from. He's from uh, Anatot. We actually know where Anatot is today as well. It's on the edge of the, it's the, edge of the desert, actually. The claim that's made by some, I am not the person who knows anything about this, but the claim is that the place where Yirmiyahu comes from, and I love the imagery of, the, of the, what grows there, is imagery that he uses, because in the area in which he's living, that's what grows in, in those areas. So it's true that, you know, whether it's the grapes or the, whether the zayat or whatever it is, it could be a function of, you know, what, he, what he's experienced in his own life, given the geographical location of, of where he's from. That's certainly possible. That's true. You don't right. No, agreed. Of course, abandoned. But I mean, it's, but it's the land that he remembers. Okay, let me, let me see. Let me just continue a bit more. So this is... We're now coming towards the end of, what time is it now, by the way? I have absolutely no clue. 10 after, 10 after 11? Okay, for 20 minutes, okay. So, um, fine. So now we have, uh, let's just, let's continue with the Haftorah of Tisha which is what we're doing. And now if you look at chapter nine, towards the end of chapter, verse 11, we have, we have the image over here, the picture over here of desolation. Ready in verse 9. For the mountains I take up weeping and wailing. So nothing's happened yet. He's, the, he's imagining whether Yemiyo is speaking or it's not clear or God speaks. I don't know. He's imagining the desolation and already taking up a lamentation, a kina, right? And then two verses later, the wise person, who, who is wise that will understand? Why did this happen? Why has the earth been laid in ruins? So the answer is, The answer is the abandoning of, of the Torah, which is my teachings. So it's not even abandoning me, says God, actually, which the Medrash breaks up. It's abandoning my teachings. If and wisdom means, the wisdom means to understand what God is demanding of us, to understand the Torah, to understand the teachings. So the problem is we don't have wisdom. That's a theme that runs throughout your Miyahu, the lack of wisdom. And the lack of wisdom, which is a Devarim theme, found first in the book of Devarim. The Torah is, a verse that the Rambam loved very much, for good reason, and very typical of the Rambam. So the idea of not having wisdom. And because you don't have wisdom, all these terrible things before you. And then Yemiyo imagines, citing in God's name, what will happen after the, the destruction. And this is found in verse number 16 of chapter 9, towards the end of the Torah of Tishabab, and without question, I think, one of the reasons they chose this particular section for Tisha B'Av. Ko amar Hashem tzvaot hitbonenu. Hitbonenu means, here they translate as, as listen, but hitbonenu, understand, understand. Even in Hebrew, the word lishmoa, by the way, has two meanings, or more than two. One is to hear, but the other is to understand, to comprehend, to perceive. So hitbonenu has, carries with it as a, Wisen up, you say, you know, wisen up. Listen, but also understand. Kirula Makona note Utfoena. Call the wailing women that they should come, the Makona note. Viela Chachamot Shilchu Vitavona. And call the wise women. So the wailers, the, the, the ones who sing the dirges, those are the women. And they're called, not just Makona note, but they're actually called Chachamot. So they there's a wisdom to it. And the wisdom, actually, this is the Haftorah for Tisha B'Av, and the, the, the Medrash picks up on something that's very central to Tisha B'Av, and it's actually the Haftorah, which is, the, the med, the, it appears in many places in the, in the, in the, in the, in the keynote that is recited by the Ashkenazi. It's Friday the most we have keynote for Tisha B'Av. And the point of Tisha B'Av was that when the spies come back, 
it says, and all the people cried. All the people cried. And the Medrash says, you cried on Tisha B'Av for no good reason. So someday you're going to cry for a real reason. And I think the point of that is, and this is the point of the Chachamot, the wisdom. The wisdom in life is to know what actually we should cry about. You cry about many things. But, but some things are not worth crying about, and some things that we often don't cry about, we should cry. And that re- that's the wisdom, the, to understand what is real, what's basic, what's important, and what's secondary. So here we have, Right? And later on, in verse 19, some of the women, for whatever reason, maybe they understand life, better understanding of life, actually. So, so listen, O women, he says, to the word of God, and teach your daughters. Teach them to how to, how to, how to lament. And uh, a woman should teach her friend kina, lamentation. The day of Tisha B'Av, the book of Eicha is called the book of lamentations. Say for Kinot, we call it Eicha because of the first word. But the tradition calls it the book of Kinot. It is ascribed in the tradition to, to Yirmiyahu, actually. And there are many commonalities between the book of Yirmiyahu. And Yirmiyahu himself, one can see him as the great lamenter. In fact, what's very interesting is that we know from a different book that he actually writes a, a, his, 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 his lament. Where do we find that Yermio writes a lament? By Yekonen, what is it? It's, in, it's, in, it's one of the keynotes. It is one of the keynotes, 100%, and it's taken from the book of Divrei Hayamim, after King Yoshiahu dies, who's a righteous king. Yermio is a prophet during the reign of Yoshio and his children. The children are no good. Tzidkiyo and Yoyakim, those. But Yoshio was a righteous king who's killed at Megiddo. And when he dies, by Yekonen Yirmiyo or Yoshiyahu, right? So Yirmiyo wrote, writes a lament for Yoshiyahu. That's at the end of Divi Hayamim, actually. Let's just find that for a second, if we can locate that very quickly. Take one minute to find it. If we can't find it, we drop it. Let's see. By Yekonen Yirmiyo or Yoshiyahu, Yoshiyahu is found towards the very end. Uh, Where's Yoshio? Chapter 30. Let's find it. 35, he makes the Pesach. Yes, here I have it. It's chapter 36. Chapter 35 of Givri Hayamim, the very end of the Bible. Vayikone Yirmiyo a Yoshio. Vayomru Koaz Sharim Vahasharot Bikino Tehem a Yoshio at Hayom. Unbelievable verse. So chapter 35, verse 25, Yirmiyahu, it says, Yirmiyahu composed laments for Yoshiyahu, which all the male and female singers recited in their laments for Yoshiyahu. As is done to this day, they became customary in Israel and were incorporated into the laments. We, the Ashkenazim, actually, on Tisha B'Av, have, have, have a lament by Yekonin Yirmiyo or Yoshio. That wasn't written by Yirmiyo. I think it's written by Elias Kalir, I believe. But he imagines, Kalir imagines what Yirmiyo might have written. It's a very interesting kina. And so you see that Yirmiyo himself writes laments. And actually, you can see the book of Yirmiyo itself as a kind of lament. And here, we have a verse that's very similar to the verse in Divri Hayamim, because there it says Jeremiah wrote a lament, and he taught all the singers to lament. And up until this day, we are reading the... So on the day of Tisha B'Av itself, right? And remember that on Tisha B'Av, it's actually very interesting, as Rabbi Salvechik pointed this out, that on Tisha B'Av, the minig of the Ashkenazim, see, the Sfardim have a different meaning. I'm not, the, I don't mean the Sfardim who... The Sahari, I mean the real Sfardim, the Eidot HaMizrach. They have an interesting, different, 
We Ashkenazim, most of us here are Ashkenazim, I assume. So the Ashkenazim on Tisha B'Av recite the keynote after the, after, after the Torah reading. Right? We have Shemona Esrei, and then we take out the Torah, and we read the Torah from Devarim, and we read the half Torah, this half Torah from Yirmiyahu. And after the half Torah, after the half Torah, we, 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 say, we say the keynote. That's the custom to say the keynote in the, in the, after, the, after, after the Torah, right? The half Torah. The, the Nusach Svard, not the Nusach Svard, the actual Svardim, don't do that. They say the keynote before the Torah reading. Which actually, when you think about it, makes complete sense because they say the, they say the keynote instead of Tachanun. Normally, the way it normally works is you, after the Shemona Esri, you say Tachanun. After Tachanun, then you read the Torah. So the Tzvardim have do exactly that. But we, for some reason, read the Torah first. After we read the Torah, sit down on the ground, and we say the keynote. So Rabbi Salovechik pointed that out. He had his own particular take on it, which is, whether you like it or not, his take was that, his take was that, I'll formulate it this way. His take was that in the Haftorah itself, it says, call the lamenters, they should lament. The Haftorah is an invitation for us, actually, to lament. And he made the argument that lamenting is problematic. Because when you read the laments of Tisha B'av, there's plenty of complaints in those laments. Attacks upon God, plenty of them. It's the other side. Yes, we deserve it. And there's plenty of it. So he always argued that in order to justify our lamenting, our keynote, we start with the Haftorah, where Yermio says, call, call the women to lament and, and, and teach your daughters, right? They call the, the wise women. They, they know, they're going to teach us what, what to say. So we say that first. That was his argument. It's an interesting argument. But certainly it's true that um, whatever the practice is, that the Haftorah, actually, this section talks about lamenting, and one can see Jeremiah himself as one who laments. He's in a funny situation. He predicts all the, all the trouble. He's very angry at the people sometimes. He calls to God to destroy them on a couple of occasions. At the same time, he's crying. As he said, I would cry the whole time. And now he says, let's, let's teach, us how to, teach us how to cry. Teach us what, what's worth crying about. So that's the section over here. And the very end of the Haftorah is also very striking. Come at the last verse of the Haftorah, Tisha B'av, which is almost the end of chapter 9. Koamar Hashem, now we quote God. Al Yitaleo Chacham Bechachmato, Al Yitaleo Hagibar Bigvurato, Al Yitaleo Oshir Biashro. So don't glory, says, says God, don't glory in your Chacham and your wisdom. Don't glory in your, in your strength, how strong you may be, or your wealth. But rather, but only glory in this. Haskel v'yodoa oti. In haskel means wisdom and knowledge. Somehow to, to, to the degree you can actually know me, says God. Ki ani Hashem, how can we know God? God is completely other, as Jeremiah himself will say in the very next chapter. However, we know one thing. We know what God wants to do. So it's interesting that this is the end of the Haftorah of Tisha B'av, and I would say two things. First of all, that Tisha B'av itself, the day of Tisha B'av, uh, is two things. It's a, it's a day of mourning. Mourning means you're thinking what has been lost. What are we missing? That's what mourning's about. What, what don't we have that we need? That's one element of Tisha B'av. The other element of Tisha B'av is it's a fast day. And fast days are different. Fast days in our tradition are not about what's missing. I mean, you have to know what's missing in order to try to repair it. The fast days are days of repentance, basically. All the fast days are days of tshuva. So tshuva means you're trying to make things better. Okay, we're missing X, Y, and Z. How do we go about repairing it? And the Haftorah, actually, which is all about the morning side of it, all about. But the very last verse, at least, ends on a more positive note. So what do we do about all this, about what's missing? And the answer is, Haskel v'yadolti, the goal is to know God. And what's striking is that <coughs> earlier in the Haftorah, it said that you can't know God. That's in chapter 9, verse number 5. Shiftecha betoch mirma. 
you dwell amongst this mirma deception. Bimirma may anu dat o ti nur mashem. In their in your deceit, you refuse to know me. So that last verse of the Haftorah is, you should glory in the ability to know me. Haskel v'yodoa oti at chesed mishpat utztaka. So the point is, the Haftorah seems to have a movement from the inability to know, because betoch mirma, and the implicit claim is that if we move away from deceit and move towards honesty, we'll be able to know God. That is to say, not necessarily to know God's essence, but to know what God wants of us, which is mishpat, tzedakah, and chesed. Those are the, that's how we end the Haftorah of Tisha B'Av. So just to summarize what we have here, um, just one second, we just summarize what we have, and you want to say something. Um, so here's the, here's the point, I, just to repeat what I started with. The book of Yermio has many, many negative prophecies, many of which are repetitive. I didn't want to dwell just on the repetitive negative prophecies. First of all, it's not so interesting. I don't have that much to say about it. But I certainly wanted to pick a couple of them because you can't read the book of Yermio without looking at some of the negative prophecies. We'll have more of them too. So I thought we would pick out a good example of a prophecy that is very uh, negative one. Talks about mourning, desolation, etc. What better prophecy to pick out than the one that we actually assign to Tisha B'Av itself, which is, of course, chapter 8 and 9 of Yermio. And there I try to show how the prophet is actually recalling other prophecies, and recalling other stories of the Torah, and uh, has a particular take in this chapter on what the problem is. The problem is, of course, other gods appears very prominent in other chapters. In this particular chapter, it strikes me, is more of an emphasis on, 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 on human behavior and human interaction, about deception, actually, about, uh, about betrayal of trust. And that, and that kind of behavior makes it difficult to actually connect to God or to know God's way, to, to study God's way, which is the study of kindness and, and equity. And that the Haftorah ends on that note of, with this, you should be concentrating not on the other things, but concentrate on how can we come to a deeper understanding. And that's the, at least I think, a positive last verse during the day of Tisha B'Av, which is not just about recognizing what's missing, but beginning at least to think about what can be done to uh, correct some of that. What do you want to say, Suri? Well, just the, the, the contrast that you're pointing out is there's a refusal, a conscious refusal to not know God. It's not that they can't, but they're not capable. If you put your heart to it and remind you, you can work on knowing God. It's possible to know God on some level. Right, but not if you, I think if you, I think, I, right, but I think sometimes, sometimes you put yourself in a certain place where it's very difficult to, to know. If you're living in a place that you're in a certain kind of culture or a certain place in society, then it's very difficult to be able to somehow escape that and to begin to think. So I think that, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. That is very true. There's no doubt that the book, there's no doubt, I mean, this is, we're not the first to say this. The book of uh, Yermio, and there's good reason for it. The book of Yermio has many, many, many literary connections to Sefer Devarim, because at the end of the day, most of Sefer Devarim, it ends up on a positive note, Zotah Bracha and all that stuff. But most of Sefer Devarim is Moshe reminding us, apart from the, the particular mitzvot, and we will get to some of the mitzvot in Sefer Yermia, because he has actually certain mitzvot that he singles out. Shabbat is one of them. Um, but most of the book of Devarim is Moshe, prior to his death, telling people what's going to happen in the future, warning them about God, God's hiddenness. Anochi astir astir panai bayomahu entering them into a new covenant, but recognizing that this covenant may be broken. And that is front and center in the book of Yermio. So we'll see next week, uh, maybe we'll talk about how the covenant plays out. There's a lot of different topics here. So we'll see how we proceed. We're not doing every chapter. We'll try to proceed through. Okay, we'll stop at this point then. then.